Now we want to say something in general about comparison-based sorting algorithms. Now this is tricky because we're actually considering all possible algorithms and showing certain properties of them. The thing that we want to show is that there is a lower bound on the running time. There's a minimum number of elementary operations in the worst case that any algorithm must take. For any algorithm there'll be some input that makes it work reasonably hard. That's what I'm trying to show here. It's fairly obvious that as the initial input list grows, the size n of it grows, that the running time should increase with n. But we don't really know yet whether it increases like n or something bigger, whether we can find some very clever algorithm which actually sorts n items in order n time, for example. So it turns out that we can't, and we're going to go through and see why. So the first thing we need to do is to think about the execution of such an algorithm. Every comparison-based sorting algorithm makes comparisons. Let's suppose we have n elements, let's say a1 up to an, those are our initial input list. The algorithm can only really make questions of this form. Let's assume for simplicity that all these are different, so we don't even have to check whether ai is equal to aj. We just want to know which one is bigger. We want to put them in the right order. So the sort of question we can ask is something like, is ai less than aj? And what we're going to do is we're going to model the execution of the algorithm by a tree where if the answer is yes, we go one way, and if the answer is no, we go another way. And this choice is consistent. So left means yes, and right means no. So we ask one question like that, then we ask another one. Here, here, depending on what happens here, we ask another one. We keep going. And this decision tree will model the execution of the algorithm. So let's consider a basic example where we have only three elements. They're all different. And we're going to use selection sort. What does selection sort do? What is the logic of this algorithm? It first checks whether A1 is less than A2. It's got to find the maximum, remember? It checks to see whether A1 is less than A2. Compares those first two. If yes, if A1 is less than A2, then A2 is the current maximum. And so I then must check A2 against A3. If A3 is the maximum, yes, right, then that's good, that's information. If it's not, it's other information. But in each case, I know the maximum of the entire list. It's either A2 or A3 in that case. On the other hand, if it turned out that A1 was not less than A2, so A1 was the current maximum, then I would have to compare A1 with A3. If A1 was less than A3, then A3 would be the maximum, and otherwise A1 would be the maximum. That would be the first pass through of selection sort. So now we would do the next pass. We would swap the maximum to the end. So in this case, A3 is the maximum. We don't have to do anything. Now we have to find the maximum of the initial sublist of size 2. And again, we would ask whether A1 is less than A2. And if it was, we don't have to go any further. Okay, we stop, and we can stop, and we can actually, that tells us, in fact, that the original ordering must have been that A1 was less than A2, was less than A3. That's the only thing that we could conclude from that. On the other hand, if it turns out that A1 was not less than A2, so A1 was bigger, then A1 would be the maximum, we'd switch that in to its position. We wouldn't have to do any more comparisons, but we would have concluded this. 
And similarly, we can fill in here, here, and here, and we have to do a fair bit of work, but eventually we will get down to the bottom of the tree there. Notice that there's a lot of inefficiency, as we've pointed out before, because here A1 less than A2 was asked, and then we ask it again here, for example. Right. Over here, we wouldn't ask it, because here A2 is bigger than A3 in this branch. That meant A2 was the maximum, so next we would swap it into the end and we would compare A1 and A3. And we would continue down there. But it is possible that we have inefficiency by asking the same question twice. That's why selection sort is inefficient, it's too many comparisons. So let's look at an example with insertion sort. Here in this tree, the circular nodes represent questions. So for example, the root node, it's asking, is A of 1 less than A of 2? We have an array, A1, A of 2, A of 3, size 3. First question asks whether the first element is less than the second element. If the answer is yes, we branch left. If the answer is no, we branch right. Let's suppose it's yes. So if the first element is less than the second element, then insertion sort performs no swaps. We branch to the left, and now we have to check the third element against the second element. So we ask whether A2 is less than A3. If it is, then we branch left and we finished. There's nothing more to do. And the square node includes the information that we've deduced from this, which is that the original list was already sorted. It was in the order A1 less than A2 less than A3. On the other hand, when we do the second comparison in the left branch of the tree, A2 less than A3, and if we get a no, then that means that the second element is larger than the third one. So the third one has to swap back past it. And now the element A3, which is now sitting in the second position of the array, has to be compared with the first one. It has to keep swapping back until it finds its right position. It could be that it's larger or smaller than the original element A1. Depending on the answer there, we're going to get either that A1 is less than A3 is less than A2, or A3 is less than A1 is less than A2 in the two square nodes at the bottom of the tree. Similarly for the right side of the tree, and the key thing to notice here is that the leaves, the square nodes, here, are not all at the same depth. What that means is that the number of comparisons required depends on the input, unlike selection sort. Okay. So that's a particular algorithm for a particular value of n. You'd have a bigger tree for bigger n, and obviously different algorithms would give different trees. What we want to do is consider all possible algorithms and deduce some interesting stuff about the tree. And what do we want to deduce about it? Well, we're looking at the running time, and we're looking at the number of comparisons. We want to know how many there are. Well, the number of comparisons here is just the height of this tree. Right? It's how far you have to go from the root down to one of these leaves down here. Notice that in each leaf down here, we have a particular initial ordering that we've deduced and they will in general be different. They might not all be different, but we know that every one of them, every one of the initial input orders has got to occur somewhere down on this tree. So now consider a general algorithm in a general tree, which will look something like this, but obviously will not be the same, in a general n. What can we say? 
Well, we can notice that at the bottom here, we have all these leaves. And the number of leaves is at least as big as the number of possible inputs. Each input is occurring somewhere down there. So it's greater than or equal to the number of possible inputs, and that's n factorial, the number of orders we could have put in. If h is the height of the tree, then how many leaves can it have? It's a binary tree. How many leaves can a tree of height h have? You can see here we've got quite a large number of leaves. If the height's too small, we're just not going to be able to get that many leaves. But let's quantify that. h is the height of the tree. You can see tree of height 0 has 1, one let's say. Tree of height 1 can only have 2 leaves. Tree of height h can't have more than 2 to the h leaves. Okay, because it's at most doubling each time you go down. Now, we have two inequalities involving the number of leaves. If we combine those, we get that 2 to the h must be bigger than or equal to n factorial. So h can't be too small. Now, if we take the binary logarithm of that, we get that h is greater than or equal to the binary log of n factorial. What do we remember from the asymptotic analysis lecture? I hope you remember that we have estimated the growth rate of log of n factorial. And we know that, in fact, it doesn't matter what base of the log we have, but it's of order n log n, in fact. So what we've concluded is that if we have a general purpose comparison based sorting algorithm that works on input of size n, then there's at least some input that's going to make it do this amount of work because this is the number of comparisons you need to do to get to the bottom of the tree. We know there are algorithms like insertion sort, for example, where the leaves don't always end up at the same level. You might make lucky guesses early on and, and not have to do any more. We know that. We're not talking about the best case, we're talking about the worst case. That's the height of the tree, the longest path from the root to a leaf. And what we've showed here is that the longest path must be at least of order n log n. For any algorithm, there's a sequence of inputs getting bigger and bigger, which make it do that amount of work. So it is not possible for a comparison-based sorting algorithm to run in order n time, for example. It's a key fact about sorting algorithms, and it's some good news here because it tells us not to waste time looking for such algorithms. It also tells us that merge sort, for example, which we've already seen, in the worst case, runs in order n log n time. So we can't do better than that. Up to a constant factor in lower order terms, we can't do better than merge sort. Of course, in practice, we may be able to do better by improving the constant in front of it, or maybe with something like quicksort, we care about the average case rather than the worst case. So there are some refinements that could still be done. We're not going to find anything massively better than merge sort for this problem, which is very different from the original Fibonacci algorithms that we looked at early on in the lectures, where there was a huge difference between the slow and the fast one. We're close to optimal here already with merge sort. Well, I've got two questions after this theoretical lecture. First, we know that there exists some sorting algorithms. You may have heard of them. Radix sort, bucket sort, these kinds of names, which can actually sort items 
in faster than n log n time, in the worst case. So what do we know about those? We can conclude something immediately from what we've talked about this lecture. Think about that, then go look them up. Find out how they work. Second question involves average case behavior. We've shown that in the worst case, every comparison-based sorting algorithm runs in order n log n time. What about the average case? Is it possible the average case could be order n, for example? We know the best case can. What about the average case? It's reasonably tricky to do, but something to think about, okay? Using similar methods to what we've already used in the lecture today. Right, we'll be back next time with our final industrial strength sorting algorithm, namely heap sort.